worship you, to praise you, and to exalt your holy name. As Moses lifted the snake up in the desert and those who were stricken by the snakes looked at it and were healed. Help us to lift you up, Lord Jesus, and look, at, look to you, look unto you, and receive our healing from you in any situation that we are in. We claim these words that I go out of my mouth, Lord Jesus, to be a life-changing moment in people's life, Lord Jesus, that they may realize where we are at this moment in time. We bless your holy name and we bless the words that come out of my mouth. In your precious name we pray, Lord Jesus. And everyone say, Amen. Amen. Life-changing moments. That's what we're speaking on. Here's a picture of a bridge. A person wants to make a bridge to cross from one situation to the other. From here to the other. And many of us are afraid of burning bridges. And we might think there are a lot of problems in between. Paul says, there's a guy called Kerry Wagner who says, you don't have to worry about burning bridges if you're building your own. But as Christians, we can say that we don't have to worry if God is going to help building a bridge to go from one place to the other. What has changed as we have seen? Every day is getting worse and worse and worse and we know that the time of the Lord is drawing near. We just have to open the papers and see the amount of confusion, the commotion, the things that are going around. Not only certain parts of the world but in every area people are getting distressed and not knowing what to do and they're taking things into their own hands and was walking in the street one day when he was brutally beaten and robbed we know this similar story in the Good Samaritan but in the modern day as he lay unconscious and bleeding a psychologist who happened to be passing by rushed up to him and exclaimed my God, whoever did this really needs help. Instead of looking to the person who was injured, we have changed our attitudes into looking the other way and saying that someone who is doing these things need help. God wants us to live an overcoming life, a life which is able to be a one filled with abundance, abundant life. And we try to do these things by reading certain things. There are a lot of self-help titles that we come through. If you go to a bookstore, you will find many self-help titles of books to help you to grow better. How to be a better you. How to lose weight in 30 days. Coming addictions, improving your marriage or something of that sort. The love languages, the five love languages or the seven love languages. When there's problem in love, we do not know whatever language comes across, comes out of our mouth. Think and grow rich. I wish it was that easy. Think and grow rich. I've seen many books that come and say, think and grow rich. I do not know how it happens. You have to work hard. The Power of Positive Thinking, Norman Vincent Peale. It had, I've read this book. It's quite a good book. Self-help titles. Rick Warren, The Purpose Driven Life. Many self-help titles. There are so many books of self-help and advice. If one of them worked, then we wouldn't need the rest of them. If one of them worked, we wouldn't need any of the rest of them. It definitely helped the authors, whether it helped you or not. <laughs> they made millions out of it. Yes. Do we get the help? We, we have to look somewhere else for help. First of all, we do not know the environment we are in, what situations are surrounding us. We cannot control that. We cannot control the weather. 
it will be sunny one day, it will be hot one day, it will be cold the other day, they will say there will be a storm coming across, there will be flooding, and there will be nothing of that sort. We do not control any of those things. God controls it. These books and these titles of self-help, even in the Christian bookstore you go, you'll find many of these types of books. They are all good books. I'm not saying against them. But we have to understand where our help should come from. We have to know where the help comes from. But we are like the guy in Luke 15 verses 11 to 20. It's like this man who had two sons. We know all, this, all know this story. And the younger one of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. And not many days after, this young son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country and there wasted his substance with riotous living. When he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of the country and he sent himself, him into his field to sweet, feed swine. He would fain have filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him anything. When he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father have bread enough to and to space, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. And I am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him and welcomed him and celebrated his return. Most of the time we find ourselves in the prodigal son territory taking my own things and going my own way father I'm going further and further away from you than what you want me to be I do not want to be in your presence my God I want to be far away from you whatever purpose you have for me in my life I will decide what my purpose is that's what we say I will decide what I will do with my life I will decide what's good and right for me I am walking away from you and I want, do not want to be anywhere near you. I want what all my talents are and I want to walk away and use my talents that you have given me, even though it's yours, it is my inheritance. Imagine you claim your inheritance from God and then you walk away with the talents that God has given you and want to use it in your own way. Because you do not understand me, Father. You do not understand me, Lord. You do not care for me. You might have a secret agenda, God. But I'm out of here. I want to go. You have your own plans, God. I do not know what you thought of me before I was being made in my mom's womb. I am in problem. I want to go. I want to use my talents. I have my own agenda. I do not want to follow your agenda. That's what we all say. And that's what we all have done in our lives. And that's, what we, we, that's where we were in our lives. God doesn't stop him. The father doesn't stop him. The father doesn't explain to him, doesn't sit and say, my son, these are the eventualities that you will face. The father doesn't do anything. He says, that's fine. These are your inheritance. You take it and go. He doesn't even stop him. Because he knows there's no point in explaining. How many of you have realized, however much you tell your children not to do a thing, they have to learn it themselves. Till then, it won't enter their mind. There is a blockage there. Take drugs, don't take drugs. You can see what's happening. But they will take it, experiment it. I'm stronger. I know what I'm doing. I'm more clever. I'm grown up. Even if we are 80 or 90 years old, I think we never grow up. We all think we have grown up, but we are still in the growing phase. The father allows him, just like the earthly fathers and parents do. You, they will explain to you. We even explain to them and say, don't do this. The father doesn't say anything. 
God doesn't say anything. He's a loving God. He knows what you're made of. He knows what your character is. He knows where you are going. He knows what your problem is. He doesn't restrict you. And he lets you go. So you might be one of those persons who started out smoking, drugs, alcohol, marriage, going your own way. So the son took his possessions and went into a distant country. A distant country in the Jewish culture means a Gentile land. A land which is filled with unbelief. A land where there is no trust in God. A land where there is no relationship with God. A land where there is no connection with God. The son walks here away with his entire faith and his heavenly, from his entire faith and from his heavenly father. And he goes into a distant country. We all have, have been in that distant country or are still in that distant country. We are still in that distant country. We need to know where we are. We are in a mess in our life because of smoking, drugs, alcohol, marital problems. We have chosen our own ways, our own, own partners, our own relationships, our own uh, choice of people. And then we realize we are in a mess. We have not asked God what his will for us in our life is. We like to please our own selfish evil desires which are the lust of our eyes, the pride of life. We love to do that. Whether we are pastors or congregation or anyone, we love to do what we like to do. No matter, no matter what others tell us or what God tells us, we like to be there. And we like to live in that distant country, spending our money, spending our substance on things which are not worth it. We do not even ask God what his plans are for in our lives. Because we think the grass is greener on the other side and every day we eat that grass, we realize the more sour it gets. And we still cannot comprehend it till that moment hits our life. We need to realize where we are. If you go in a shopping mall, and you get lost. You know these maps are there. You do not find the place where you are going first. It usually shows you are here. You re need to realize where you are in life. You are here. You are next to that car or jewelry or jubilee health store of the purses. And then you have to work your way where you have to go. First you have to realize where you are in your life. You have to realize the distant country where you are. The realization of where you are in life is when the awakening to the situation happens. So no matter what God tells, what the word of God tells, what, the, what your parents tell, what your common sense tells, or what your intuition tells, or whatever it tells you, or whatever you feel like, it's that moment in life, the awakening starts when you are in a desperate mode and you suddenly realize where you are. Most of the time, we are in the mall, not even concerned of where we are. We are just trying to move around in this life without knowing where we are. We need to know where God wants us to be in, his, in our lives. God is a loving God. So a distant country can be defined as an area of our lives where we have walked away from God. It can be applicable to each one of us. An area of your life where you have walked away from God. So like they say, you invite Jesus into your life and you restrict him to only one part of your heart rather than giving him reign over all your heart. So you have restricted God's ability to work in your life. And you're still distant in a distant country, in a Gentile country or an unbelief country, in the area of your life where you have walked away from God. What are the areas of your life where you have walked away from God, where God is not welcome in your life? This is my secret place, Lord. I do not want you to interfere. I will decide who I choose to marry. I will decide why I want to marry. I will decide why I want to smoke. I will decide why I want to be addicted. 
I would decide what it is I will do to cheat, what it is I will do to lie, what is those areas of your distant country. You can list it one, two, three. Which are the areas in your life? You can write it down now also and write down. These are the distant areas where I do not want God to be part of my life. That's the areas that you need to realize where you are. So you need to know where you are at this moment in life. What drives us to this distant country? Many of us are driven to this country because we are running away from a God that doesn't exist. From our perception of God that doesn't exist. For us, we are running away from this God whose perception doesn't match up with reality. We are rejecting a God whom we created than a true God who created us. So we have this perception of God, an ever-loving God, a beautiful God. And if it doesn't work our way, we say, no, that's not the Lord I worship. I go away and away. So this man, in his youth, realized he's all knowledgeable. And he said, I'm running away from you, Lord, because you are an unreasonable father. You are an unreasonable father. I cannot reason with you. You are making us miss out on things. You have this long list of rules. Do not do this. Do not do that. Do not do this. You are taking the fun out of my life. I want to party. I want to smoke. I want to take drugs. I want to uh, have uh, relationships. I want to have fun with the opposite sex or whatever you want. You want to fill that. You are an unreasonable father. You want to take the fun out of my life. And we say, look at those unbelievers, how much fun they are having. And we are sitting here listening to the word of God and we still have these problems. You are an unreasonable father, Lord. God sometimes is described as the great cosmic killjoy. You kill the joy for everything. That's what you think of God. You have not realized who the God it is that you worship. That's why you describe him as someone who is impersonal to you. You are an unreasonable father. Sometimes we think of him as an unpleasable father. We cannot please you, Lord. There's no way we can please you. Your standards are so high. All have fallen short, sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Everything what we do is against you. And we think you're unpleasable. Your standards are so high, we cannot please you. If we score an A grade, a B grade, then we, the father will say, why didn't you score an A? If he scored 20, then we say, why didn't you score a 30? At some point, we will try quitting to please him altogether. So we start moving away from God because we have this God in our mind who is unreasonable, unpleasable. And then we come and we say, you are unmerciful because you find pleasure in distributing punishment. You are punishing all these things. People say, he's unmerciful. He doesn't even, uh, he's, he's distributing this punishment, waiting to catch our wrongdoings. If you are taught to fear God, you will respond naturally by running away. You run away and don't give a chance because he's a fearful father. He's an unmerciful father. He's an unrelenting father. He is really someone whom you have to be afraid of. Some see him as an uncaring father. You do not care. That's what people say. The God doesn't care. That's why things are happening around this world. I don't care about him. But most of these people who are going through these problems have not cared for him in the first place either. And suddenly when things go wrong, they say that you are an uncaring father and the more they walk away. They have not been with him in the first place. And they land in this problem and they start moving away from him. Whatever the reason caused you to leave the father and head out, you will inevitably find yourself in a place where you are in desperate need for help. The kind of help that self-help books, self-help things and you yourself cannot give you. So you are in a position in a distant place in your life from God. Whether you are addicted, involved in drugs, alcohol, smoking, etc., etc., you have come to a point where there is no place to turn around. There's nothing that you can do to help yourself. 
that's when your journey begins that's when that light clicks in your mind and says i am in a place where i cannot do anything that's when you go to that map area and say you are here till then you are roaming in the mall finding the place where you have to go and you have not reached that destination and suddenly you come to that map and then you realize this is where i am now this is my position i am distant away from my lord and i cannot reach my destination without knowing where i am in the beginning itself so you have to realize you come to that moment in life that life changing moment where you suddenly awaken and say my god where am i i am in this horrible mess my parents told me that's not the right thing to do no i i am doing it my way that's not the right person to go after no i'm going my way that's not the right job to go that's not the distant country you need to go to find a job no i'm going my way you suddenly awaken and you realize where you are one knows this thing in the morning Effectiveness of this alarm is a direct correlation to how much you want to hear them. Realize that. If you are trying to catch a plane at 6.50 in the morning and you have set the alarm for 3 in the morning, when you go to sleep, you are going to sleep expectant to hear the alarm at 3 and even if there is a slight noise, you will wake it up and you won't hit the snooze button at that moment because you realize if you snooze, you lose. You lose your money, you lose the time, you lose the place where you have to go to and you have to reorder the thing again. But it's a, it's a usual thing in the morning. I'm not telling about this church, like you want to get up to go to church in the morning. We hit the snooze and then again hit the snooze at 5 minutes, then 10 minutes, then 20 minutes. We don't want to hear it at all. It's a direct correlation to how much you want to hear them. These alarms don't ring in us when we are going to that distant country. The sounding of the alarm. Hear that. The young girl who has a young family and they're having a good time in the family and they're having maybe some quarrels and some things and suddenly she connects on Facebook to this old college sweetheart she had met in long time ago and they said, oh, let us meet, let's have coffee together. And she goes back, meets this person and they have a real joy and say, oh, I've been missing out on all these things. I feel young again. I feel like a kid again. I feel, I feel really happy again. And she comes back and she comes enjoyed back home, really feeling thrilled and she knocks off one of the photographs and it falls down and she lifts it up and she sees her, f her husband and the kids making funny faces at her in that. That's the alarm sounding moment. The moment the alarm hits you and you realize either I go that way or I go this way. If you have not listened to the alarms in your life, you will go more and more in the distant. God is a patient God. He waits patiently. He realizes what you are made of. He knows when the alarm system is going to hit you. Sooner or later, the alarm will sound when you are in the distant country. Now this fellow, he got up, he walked away from his father's home, he went and had a riotous time. It may have been four years, five years, he had a party. Money started dwindling. He didn't invest anywhere. The money started dwindling. He started knowing that the money is going. The alarm sounded then. But he didn't want to hear it. He snoozed the alarm and said, No, I will still proceed. So when you go into things in life like uh, a drug, alcohol, or adultery, say, I'll just taste this little bit. I'll just hold hands and walk along that way. I will just comfort this person and say, I want to be there for you. And you just walk that distance and suddenly that small alarm in your heart says, my son, my daughter, that's not the right place to go. 
snooze. No, nothing's going to happen. I just have a bit of a snooze and just see what the world enjoys. And I start moving further. These two are believer sons, children of the Most High God. One stays back and one stays, goes away. Both have their own agenda. So we are all in that group. We all take that snooze button and go away from God. So realize when that alarm is. So this guy, money started dwindling, the alarm started going, he didn't realize it. And he went a bit further. His friends started dwindling. And he started spending all, and there arose a famine in that land. And he began to be in want. Even here, he didn't realize where he is. The alarm hit him there. The famine came on. There's another alarm that sets in. The news about your adultery will be known by one friend. The alarm hits you and says, oh, we'll tell your friend, don't, no, I'm just trying to get out of this. Uh, just hold on. Nothing's going to happen. And just drinking this one glass more, the friend knows, oh, you are having an alcohol problem. The friend comes and tells you, but you do not obey it. And you say, no, I'll just taste a little more. And off you go. So he went into the land of famine. And he still didn't realize. And he still had the snooze button. The more you hit the snooze, the more you go into the loser's territory. You have to awaken at that moment in time. And then he went and joined himself to an unbeliever saying, Oh, Instead of going to someone who believes in God, he went to a person of that distant country and goes to its neighborly friends who look friendly and says, can you help me? No one is out there to help you. They have their own agendas. So he says, you take care of those pigs and then you can eat whatever the pigs give you or the, the food that is left over. The alarm didn't hit him then either. So he is more into trouble. He still not realized what's happening with him in his life. He still not realized what's happening with him in his life. And he says, suddenly he came to himself and he realized, my goodness, where am I this moment? How many hired servants of my father have bread enough to spare and I perish with hunger? I am a prince of the most high God. I am a child of the Most High God. And where am I now because of my snoozing problem? I have not listened to the alarms that are ringing in my life all this time and suddenly I am in that desperate situation where I have nothing else but pig's food to eat. And that's where we are many of the times. We are eating pig's food and suddenly the alarm goes in. I need to get back to where God is. And he says, I will arise and go to my father and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. He's not only sinned against his father, but he sinned against God, where he has moved away from the direction that God wanted to give him in his life. God loves you. We have this conception about he is an unreasonable father, an unpleasable father, an unmerciful father, an uncaring father. But if you go to 2 Chronicles 36, 15, and the Lord God of their fathers sent warnings to them by his messengers. He sent alarms to them by his messengers. Rising up early. He rose up early. God rising up early. Imagine God is sleeping or rising up early. Rising up early and sending them because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. He even gets up before you even get up. He, rising up early. He sends you early warnings. And he sends them out to you. And you have to wait and see what God is telling you. Is the alarm sounding in your life? He took action early. God takes action early. God is a loving God and that's what we have to realize. Who is this God we are worshipping? Who is this God we are running away from? He's not the one we have created, but he is a caring father. He's a merciful father. He's one who loves us. He wakes up early and sends messengers to you to say, turn around and come to me and I will bless you. I will turn your life around. I will change your life around. This is when you have to wait 
patiently and listen to the Lord and say, that's the alarm which sounds in me. So this guy could have been okay when even the money started dwindling and he might have had that alarm go in his mind and say, I need to return to my father. This is not the life that I will need to spend. The alarms go in our lives and we do not realize. His word comes at the right time. God's word comes at the right time. Cain and Abel, Genesis 4, 6 to 7. So the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry and why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not, if you, if you do not do well, sin lies at the door and its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. God warns him. God saves to Cain. Even before he fell down, God said, why are you so angry and why has your countenance fallen? Why are you so looking so depressed? Why are you so angry? If you had done the right thing, would I not have accepted you? I love you as much as I love Cain. Here God doesn't say that he doesn't love Cain. He looks at Cain and he talks to Cain more than Abel. And he says, I love you. And Cain is not willing to listen. And he says, sin is lurking at your door. The alarm is saying that sin is lying at your door. It is near the entrance where you are. It's so close to you that it will destroy you. The power of the devil is to destroy you and his desire is for you that you do not be a child of God and you remain and die in that distant, Gentile, unbelieving land and you do not come back into communion with God. That's the power of sin. And sin is re at the door. So you, if you have done the right thing, I will accept you. Do not go and open that door. Sin is just there waiting to pounce on you. But you need to rule over that and come back to me. We do not want to listen to that. The word of God is there and ever present help. Do not do this. Why? God is not putting up these rules so that he does that cosmic killjoy thing for you. He wants to protect you. wants to put that hedge of fire around you. He wants to guide you. But you do not want to listen. And then you wake up one day and say, the church is bad. The people are bad. Everything is bad. God is bad. Everything is against me. And no one is for me. And off you run away and away and away from God. And you find yourself in a deeper and deeper and deeper mess. The more you run away, the more you are. And suddenly you have this awakening moment. Are you wanting to snooze the button or are you willing to turn around and come back to the Lord? The second time is when the words of someone comes into your life. It might be a friend. It might be a brother. It might be a church member. Who comes and tells you, my brother, my sister, you're doing this wrong. You're going around with the wrong person. You're rowing around with the wrong companion. Proverbs 27, 6, faithful are the words of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. That person who is telling you that something is wrong in your life is to build you up. It's not to destroy you that because he's concerned about where you're going because he's your friend. Amen. He doesn't want to see you lost and in trouble. So this is the second thing which happens. First God speaks to you, then a friend speaks to you. And still you don't realize. Say, no, I'll go this way. I know who I am. I can take care of myself. I'm strong enough. I can control the addiction that I have. No. Third thing happens is the future. Taste of future consequences. Regret again, not practicing enough, failure in a test, not studying. You get caught out with someone and you feel uncomfortable. These are alarms which sound in your life. Taste of future consequences. When you taste this, realize that you are going deeper in trouble. When you are going out with someone and you feel uncomfortable in the righteous way, realize that that's the alarm that's going on in your life and you have to turn around. That's a taste of the future consequences. A person not studying well and doing bad in his exams is a taste 
of what will happen to him in his future life. It's a taste to realize I need to study hard and get better at my school work and get better at my college work and need to go further. If not, I will be struggling the rest of my life. That's a taste of the future consequences. A taste of getting caught out with someone. No one knows me in Adelaide. I'll walk around with this lady and suddenly Ian comes to me and says, oh, what are you doing with this lady? Oh no, we are just roaming around. That's a taste of the future consequences. Turn around and come back to God and you will be saved. So if the word of God comes to you in the right time, the word of someone in your life and a taste of future consequences. The fourth is the example of others before us. 1 John 3.12 As Cain, who was the wicked one and murdered his brothers. But why did he murder him? Because his works were evil and his brothers righteous. This is a taste of what happened to Cain. He murdered him and he became the evil one. Because his works were evil. The examples of others before us. You may have seen people die of cirrhosis of liver. And you have a drinking problem. It's an alarm which goes on in your life and says, turn around my dear friend, my dear son, my dear brother. Otherwise you're on to this path of getting a bloated belly, getting all yellow and dying. Your friend has a heart attack or has cancer of the lungs. That's an alarm of what's wrong you're doing in your life. Are you waiting to hear that or are you waiting to stop at that moment? Don't snooze the button. Come to that awakening moment. Come to that awakening moment. Awake, you who sleep. Arise from the dead and Christ will shine on you. Christ will give you the light. You have to awake from your snooze. You have to awake from your slumber. You have to awake from where you are and realize where you are and realize and awaken and say like that person in the Bible. He says, my father's hired people have better food than me. And what am I doing here eating this pig's food? What am I doing here eating this rotten stuff? which is not healthy for me, which is not making me go anywhere, which is not making me even in the will of my father. I'm going distant and distant away from my father. You need to come to that awakening moment. That's that life-changing moment which happens in your life. It awakens you out of your slumber and it will make you rise from the dead and Christ will give you light. Jesus' resurrection is not only for the eternal life that you all have, but it's also somewhere, something which God tells you to say that you have to awake from your slumber wherever you are in that distant country, in that part of your life which you have kept God separate and said, God, I do not want to you to enter into this aspect of my life, this addiction of my life. I want that to open up and I want to return to you. And I want to give that all up. Christ will shine on you. You need to awake. You need to awake out of that slumber. Just like that fellow said, how many hired servants of my father have bread enough and to spare? And I perish with hunger? Are you perishing with hunger today? Are you perishing with sadness today? Are you perishing with sickness today? Are you perishing because of that sin that is empowering you, that is controlling you, that is leading you, and that is leading you away from God? Awaken, rise, and Christ will shine, of, shine on you. Turn around, repent, believe, and be baptized, and come into the abundance of Christ. Stop going the worldly way. Stop going into the Gentile way. Stop even playing around with the Gentile fun that they have. God will give you the abundance of joy. Don't think that these people who are sitting around and smoking and drinking and alcohol and uh, having fun and uh, uh, having adultery and parties and everything and having fun. No. The joy of the Lord is much higher than what you think the worldly people are having. It's great to be in the presence of the joy of the Lord. It's great to have the joy of the Lord in your life. 
You have to taste and see that the Lord is good. Once you taste and see, you wouldn't be tasting the pig's food that is there in front of you. You have to realize that the taste of the Lord is much better than the food that we think is tastier in the world. We have to awaken and Christ will shine on you. That's my message today. At that life-changing moment, that's the first part of my message, is to awaken, turn around and come back to the Lord. Say, Lord, I cannot help myself. The doctors cannot help myself. The, nothing can help myself. Lord, humble yourself and say to the Lord, I cannot do anything. I am just returning back to you. You take care. The Father sees you at a distance, comes running to you because you are drawing nearer to him. Draw nearer to him and he will draw nearer to you. Till you draw nearer to him, the Father is still looking out for you. And the more you come drawing nearer to him, he will draw nearer to you. He will come nearer to you, fill you with his power, cover you with his robe, put kisses on you and lift you up and bring you into his house and have a good party to help you come and build yourself, edify yourself, strengthen yourself and grow in the Lord and say that the taste of the Lord is good. The there is abundance of joy in the Lord's house. I want to return to this abundance of joy which is there in the Lord's house. Do not think that the taste of the world is good. It is not good because only the taste of the Lord is good. Only the joy of the Lord can be your strength. There's nothing else which can strengthen you. There's not even cars, money, anything that can give you pleasure, kids, family, these can never give you pleasure. It's only the joy of the Lord who is an ever-present help in the time of trouble that will give you the joys that are, you are looking for, that will fill the thirst. Jesus says to that woman in the Samaritan well, the water that I give you will quench your thirst. If you are looking for waters in this world, that will not quench your thirst. But if you are looking to the righteous spiritual water that comes out from the word and the mouth of God, the words that proceed out of the mouth of God every day, every moment, every time in your life, you will be having abundance of life and eternal life and ever present and ever loving and an ever encouraging life that will be there in your life. You need to change. You need to awaken and come back to the Lord. Stop hanky-panking around and saying that I love the Lord with all my heart. But turn around and say, Lord, I am weak, but you are strong. You are the one who can turn this bread, stones into bread in my life. I do not want to do it myself. Jesus didn't do it himself. He said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. The words of God will proceed out of his mouth every day. You have to humble yourself, sit at his feet every day and listen to him. Have that awakening moment in your life and turn around and God will supply all your needs according to the riches of his glory. Amen. Let's all stand up and thank God for the message that he's given us today.